I V M. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hi guys, I'm your host Saif with my co-host Faiza, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Now, before we get on with today's episode, a quick shout out for Hub Hopper. You can now listen to your favorite travel podcast, The Musafir Stories, on Hubhopper, India's largest podcast directory that brings you thousands of unique shows and stories from every imaginable genre, on demand and on the go. So go ahead and download the Hubhopper app from the App Store or the Play Store now. And on with today's episode. So about today's episode, our guest Sharanya Ayer who's a pro-traveler and a blogger at trulynomadly.com, takes us to a place that I bet you'll have a hard time finding on the map. A place that is still untouched, raw and waiting to be explored. So let's jump into the conversation and find out more. So with that introduction, I'd like to welcome Sharanya Ayer from the blog Truly Nomadly. Sharanya, thank you so much for being a part of the Musafir Stories and welcome to the podcast. Hi Sharanya, welcome to the podcast. Hi guys, thank you so much for making me a part of this. I've been following your podcast for a while now and I think it's a great medium to talk about travel. Thank you, thank you Sharanya and uh, it's our pleasure that uh, we could have a pro traveler like you come join us and uh, share your stories on this podcast, on this medium. So thank you so much. But uh, before we get on with uh, further details... The introduction I gave about you is quite concise. So why don't you t- go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, about Sharanya Ayer and the blog Truly Nomadly. So like you said, I am a travel blogger and that's how I classify myself right now primarily mm-hmm. as a travel blogger and a freelance writer. But I also do a bunch of other smaller gigs here and there as a freelancer. So there's no real box anymore. Okay. Uh, but before this, I was in the space of marketing and brand management for seven years I was an all-out corporate girl and I gave that up only last year to kind of center my life around travel because I soon realized over time that that is what got me really happy and um, driven and excited about life I made a very deliberate choice to give up a very dream corporate career it was it wasn't like I was having a bad time there I, I didn't have a bad boss I didn't have like bad colleagues who were out to get me there was no breakup you know people keep asking me there's some big tragedy that made me quit my corporate career but there's nothing none of that it was just a conscious decision to allow myself to do what I really love uh, which is travel and I wanted to create a life for myself that allowed more of it which corporate life didn't so that's kind of how the the shift and the transition happened and do now, yeah. That's great, and that's a great choice to make to give up something. And for... a brave, and a brave yeah. one too. I know. Yeah, thank you. But I always, I, I talk about this a lot on my social media and my blog. I do not encourage these articles that talk about, oh, just quit your job and follow your dream. It's not as simple as that. And it shouldn't be like a mission statement for the youth today. And I never encourage that. It's Like I said, it's a very conscious, well thought out decision. So that's that's kind of what I'm experimenting with right now. Lovely. So, Sharanya, getting on with the interview, right? We have a little tradition of the Musafir stories that whenever we have a guest a traveler come speak with us, we request them to take us and our listeners on a journey. Everything from uh, the preparation that went into it, uh, from the experiences they had at the place, the things they saw, the kind of people they met, the kind of food they sampled, everything uh, from A to Z of that trip. So with that in mind, where do you want to take us and our listeners to today? So um, I'm going to take you to a very, very special place called Mechuga in Arunachal Pradesh. Okay. It's a really remote alpine hamlet at about 6,000 feet above sea level. Uh-huh. And I had no idea about it two weeks uh, b- until two weeks before I went there, before I decided to go there. And it remains to be one of my top two favorite places to travel to in India. So that in Kashmir. So I'm really excited to take you to Machuka with me today. 
Okay, great. We are equally excited to listen. But uh, tell us why Mechuka. I mean, you said that it is one of your top favorite How plays. How did it even yeah. come into your mind, uh, Mechuka? Because I, uh, I have to confess, like, before we spoke about this, um, I hadn't uh, heard a lot about this place. So that way, even in the travel blogger circuit, I think this is pretty undiscovered at the moment, right? It is, it is. And I think everything just came together so wonderfully to take me here. I think uh, I keep I think, keep thinking to myself and I keep telling people, I think Machuka wanted me there. It's just like, <laughs> hidden I had no idea such a place even existed. Because see, that's the thing. When I sat down to uh, plan my trip to the Northeast, mm-hmm. I incidentally went there in the month of April for three weeks solo. I'd never been to any of those seven sister states in the Northeast. And mm-hmm. You know, I decided that it's about time I explored my country more than, you know, and beyond the obvious routes. So that's how the Northeast happened. And I knew that I wanted to go to Arunachal. And I collaborated with a local company there called Chalo Hoppo. Mm. Uh, they are a bunch of like really passionate uh, young boys who started up this uh, travel company to promote experiential travel in the Northeast. They're from the mm. Northeast. They gave up their jobs and they went back to um, promote the Northeast. And I had a quick conversation with them. And they brought Mechuka to my attention. Okay. And um, I was like, hmm, okay, I've never heard about this place. So I just went online. And if you see Arunachal's map, it's a massive state, right? Sure. And um, on the main map, you won't even see Mechuka. <laughs> and I was like, that's it. I'm going here. It's not even on the map. So the very, <laughs> you know, someone telling me about this place that even after opening a map, I couldn't see it. I was like, I am going here, right? Wonderful. And uh, Sharanya, please tell us, how did you get there? Yeah, because you're telling yeah, that it's an so, yeah, uh, elaborate quite... process getting there. So Yeah, we would love to know how did you get to the place. What I did was I took a train called the Lachit Express from Guwahati. Mm-hmm. See, uh, when you're in the northeast, Guwahati is kind of like your hub to get around to places. It's one of the main airports sure. in those parts. Mm-hmm. So I landed into Guwahati. I got into the overnight Lachit Express, which is a 12-hour train okay. into uh, this border town called... Murkong Selek, which is at the border of Assam and Arunachal, okay, right? Okay, okay. The night train, I got there early the next morning. And from Murkong Selek, you get these shared taxis or shared autos that take you across the border by road into the first town in Arunachal called Pasi Ghat. Okay. So you, you, that's the first spot where you're checked. There's the border and there is the, what's called Ruksin Gate. Okay which is where you have to produce what is called your INP, which is the inner line permit. Okay. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I think it uh, it would be good to call out at this point, right, that um, Arunachal is one of the seven sister states that does need the inner line permit to get in. Absolutely. So, this is something that you need to get in advance. Mm-hmm. And there are a few ways to get it done. One is you apply for it online a week or so in advance and you just get it delivered to you, take printouts, show, show it wherever it's required. Okay. What I did was um, I got it at the airport in Guwahati. That's an option and it's instant almost. Oh, okay. It's, it's um, 400 rupees, which is a tad bit more expensive than the online process, which is about 100 or something. Mm-hmm. But I just landed at Guwahati. I had to just go fill in a form and I had the ILP in my hand in like 20 minutes. So... Mm. So you cross Ruxin Gate, it's a half an hour journey on to Pasi Ghat, mm. which is uh, where you get um, a shared sumo to the first big town called Along. Okay. 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 Now, uh, the great thing about the Northeast, especially Arunachal, is these sumos run like clockwork. They leave at a certain hour in the morning. Mm. Uh, there's, there's an early morning and there's 11.30 a.m. one, which is the one I took. And it's a four-hour drive to the town of Along, which is the last big town in the upper West Siang district. Mm -hmm. So that was a four-hour journey. I got to Along by evening. And so that was my first pit stop. I had to stay the night there before I took the shared cab to uh, Mechuka the next day. So you had accommodation that was booked there or... uh... There are homestays, there are tiny hotels around the center of the town. Okay. So I had booked my homestay in advance, yes. Okay, okay. Along was the last real stop and again, very beautiful with a lot of paddy fields. And mm-hmm. so that's when you start seeing the, the mountainous landscapes of Arunachal, the misty mountainous landscapes. Mm-hmm. You, it's a long uphill drive, it's, a, it's winding roads, really uh, narrow winding roads with uh, cars coming and going in on that same road. So there are no separate roads for traffic. Mm. So it's quite the scary drive. And what I, at least the time of year I visited, 
the clouds in Arunachal, like they put up such a show for me because they used to be really low hanging and really misty. So it just felt like I was entering another world altogether, right? <laughs> so that that was how long I spent okay. the night. There. So the next morning, I was on the 5.30 a.m. shared taxi to uh, Mechuka. Okay. Now, the thing with these shared sumos is it's best to book it a day in advance. When you get to that town, you anyway get off at the sumo stand. Mm-hmm. And that's where all the sumos are upwards to Mechuka as well. Mm-hmm. So um, what happens with these sumos, interestingly, is you also book your seat number. Right. Okay. Right? Which is basically the best seat in the house is one, which is up front next to the driver, the window seat. Okay. So like I said, there are eight people in a sumo. So even in the front of the driver, there are two people. So oh there's God. seat one. <laughs> one and two. You don't want seat two because you're wedged in between the driver <laughs> and the, the window seat. Yeah. Uh, then there's three and six, which is the window seats in the middle row of the sumo. Uh-huh. And then there's the first row in the sumo, which is the back row. Doesn't uh-huh. matter where you're sitting. So it, it's very, very important that you try and book your... Um, seat and your ticket the previous day okay. so you get to sit where you want to sit and so that's what i did i booked my seat for the next day and there are at least three to four sumos that go up to uh, mechuka on that uh, 5 30 a.m batch and uh, all these sumos go together they stop at the same uh, you know roadside uh, restaurant for meals and chai and so it's a really like nice little road trip Mm-hmm. And it's an eight-hour long road trip to Mechuka. So that's a very long travel day. Wow. <laughs> it is. And signal pretty much like I think an hour or two into it. That's it. The next time my phone pinged was um, uh, four days later. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh, my God. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, this is like no other network works there or uh, was this? BSNL does, but data is very weak. Calls work on BSNL, but okay. uh, data is very weak. And mm-hmm. I had... Uh, bad old Vodafone so and I didn't want network there anyway so you can get a local SIM card of course if you want some connectivity but I told my parents to you know be calm and be okay I was gonna be back in 40 so I had no reason to have network beyond that <laughs> okay. Okay. you last uh, sort of decently big town you cross before you hit Mechuka is called Tatu okay. T-A-T-U right mm-hmm. that's the last uh, place again there are a few shops and there's like uh, a decent restaurant there where we had our last meal before we hit Mechuka. Okay. So, um, about half an hour before you enter Mechuka is the uh, Seco Dido waterfalls. Oh, okay, Beach, yeah. Or just like super high, falling down, cascading down from this real big height. Mm. So, that's the only uh, pit stop of note. The car okay. stops by, you get down, you take a few pictures, uh, soak in the misty uh, water for a bit. Okay. And then you're, you enter Mechuka like soon after all. And you you hit Mechuka by about two two thirty in right. the afternoon. Okay, so it's it's been I think um, as you rightly put it quite uneventful in that sense. But uh, yeah, the Seco Dido kind of makes things um, nice and cozy just before you enter I Mechuka, feel, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Lovely. So it's been around two to thirty, and uh, it's it's a long day, as you said, uh, especially sitting in a cramped sumo shared sumo. Did you have anything planned for the rest of the day, or was it just lunch and relaxing for that day? So I, again, had booked a homestay there. I knew that uh, Mechuka has a bunch of homestays again. There are no hotels. Mm -hmm. There is one tourist lodge under construction right now. Uh, But that's it. There are um, three to four homestays that you can find online. Mm -hmm. And there are more which maybe you come across once you get there. But I pre-booked my accommodation at um, what is said to be one of Mechuka's earliest homestays. It's it's run by uh, the man of my trip, the man who made my trip. Uh, it's Gebu Sona. He's it's G E B U. Okay, right. Okay. He runs a lot of like uh, little hiking trips around Mechuka, and he's, he's this like huge proponent of tourism in Mechuka. So he really goes out of his way to make any any person who comes there feel really really good. So um, like I said, uh, I was very very excited to go out and see Mechuka. And I got in, had a quick shower, had some chai with them and uh, set out to just walk around the town. That's typically how I get acquainted with any place that I go to. Uh I just like to take a walk around the place and uh, soak in the vibe of the village. So um, I set out in the first um, spot of interest that I saw. So there are two monasteries in Mechuka. There is uh, what is called the new monastery, which is inside the town itself. Mm -hmm. And then there is the... 400 year old Samten Yongcha monastery which is way older than the Tabang monastery also it's wow. one of the oldest monasteries in the country uh, it's 400 right? years wow 400 years wow 
100 years old and that's where the Dalai Lama came to visit in 2003 when they set up the roads for him oh, so that okay. is about 16 kilometers away from the main town but on day one I went to the new monastery which is uh, right in the center of the town it's it's uh, up on a hill so you can see it from anywhere mm. so it was very easy to get there you just walk around like I said it's all about talking to people and asking for directions that's how you get to places okay. uh, so and all I did was place and ask them kaise jana hai they be like madam <laughs> So, <laughs> and then Sharanya, if I may also ask, uh, getting about uh, Mexico, right? Uh, obviously, it is pretty small. But uh, was like walking the only means of getting to places, or again, uh, did you have to take like shared rickshaws or uh, shared cabs or something like that? Um. So yeah, good question. That there is no local transport in Mexico. There are no rickshaws, mm. and the shared sumos aren't for internal use. They're only to go back down to Along. So oh. inside Mexico itself, you can walk around the town. It's it's small enough to do um. You know, to just walk around by foot. But like I said, and I'll get to all of the other places I went to. You need a car. You'll need uh to arrange for a car, which for me, luckily, uh, Gebu uh did. Okay. The guy. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um day one was me just walking around uh, checked out the new the new monastery uh went to the marketplace again uh, great stuff uh, at the market great boots for like 1500 bucks <laughs> jackets jeans uh, it's a dream if if you go there and you don't intend to shop you will still come back with a lot of like souvenirs and a lot of art so there's a lot of um, Bhutanese influence also because Bhutan also follows the Tibetan version of Buddhism. So, uh, Buddhism is the 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 main religion in uh, Mechuka. You will see uh, so many uh, what are called chotins. These are the the stupas. Right. They're all around town. There are prayer flags all over. There are prayer wheels here and there. So it's like a very very. I am a huge lover of Buddhism as such. I, I I was just in Bhutan a couple of months before the northeast. So okay. to me, this was like very dreamy. My day one was just. getting acquainted with you know that vibe of the place yeah, meeting okay. people and everyone uh, over there is so friendly like i used to be just called out and asked if i've come alone because they're so not used to travelers and especially mm-hmm. to see this tiny little girl walking around town you know i was like quite the uh, celebrity on day one because everyone was like akila ya akila ya and i was like oh. <laughs> so you know it was uh, that so for me day one was literally uh, just walking around checking out the new monastery and soaking in the feel of the place yeah and doing some shopping looks like uh, and yeah. it uh, really reminds me of uh, the episode we did with ankita right um, from uh, monkey right. monkey inc right so she was uh, she uh, shared her experience at tawang and uh, one of the first things that she mentioned oh, wow. as well was about the very reasonably priced and uh, lovely looking it. boots yes <laughs> the thing there the jackets the boots the all of the woolens over there they, i i don't know where they get it from and how they sell it so cheap but um, <laughs> i had to like i have them quote the price again because uh, from a business mind i was like why are you not making more profits from these beautiful boots <laughs> oh, <sweet. laughs> yeah lovely so uh, day one seems like um, uh, at least in terms of um, going around to places it doesn't seem very heavy right you took it slow and i think that's a good thing especially as you scale up the altitude as well it's good to take it slow in the first couple of days kind of get used to the uh, the altitude the terrain and everything so that's how it looks appears that you also did the same thing uh, but faza had one quick yeah, question for you <laughs> sharin i would like to know uh, what about food i mean um, what all new things did you try So um I am not a big meat eater and at that point in time also I had recently turned vegetarian so okay. I ate uh, regular stuff like rice and um, you know stuff that they'd make me chow mein is a big part of their cuisine over there okay. but if you eat eater there's a lot of pork uh, and chicken and beef to be had there in terms of curries and in terms of like dry uh, you know like think of a starterish kind of feel okay. so they are really known for their pork there but uh, my meals were largely uh, at the homestay itself mm-hmm. and um, the great thing about their tradition and their community so the the, the dominant tribe in mechuka is what is called the memba tribe right okay a lot of them have come down and crossed over from tibet back in the day like long long time ago mm. before the so their tradition is that they have uh, open kitchens so that's where the whole family kind of like hangs out and if there are guests that's where you sit around the fireplace and they include the person who's cooking so it's not like the person's doing their job in the kitchen and the rest are hanging out uh-huh. so it's a very key community vibe you know someone's cooking over the fire or you're sitting around the fireplace you're chatting you're having 
um i have to talk about the alcohol that you can have there the local sure. uh, the species right yeah. so they it is called uh, Ch- chang beer okay chang beer chang. It's, it's 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 made out of millet so okay. the millet beer is called chang okay. uh-huh. then they also have uh, beer made from rice mm. okay and then they have the ara wine okay. and they have obviously like a bunch of other regular stuff that they pick up from along but this is the local like okay. alcohol that you must try and it's so my first night there i'm sitting around this uh, fireplace and kebu is talking to me about you know all of his ancestors and the tribes and the beliefs and how they used to walk they could back in the day walk up to lhasa and tibet wow. before the war, there was uh, obviously there was no um, strict boundaries and borders so he talks about how his own grandfather has been to lhasa by road and come back so it was just getting again acquainted with the culture of mechuka its history and getting really really happy high on uh, chang <laughs> so lovely and uh, okay so uh, i think we're all set to head out uh, head out on this uh, adventure uh, where did you start off your journey uh, the next day we woke up in the morning to this maddening rain like i wake up and i can hear the rain pounding on the roof and uh, i look out and i can't see beyond a few meters so i go into the uh, kitchen for breakfast and we're just sitting there and wondering when we can step out we had to wait out the storm mm-hmm. it cleared out in about like 3 hours it started drizzling and we said okay let's take the car and step out mm-hmm. uh, but we had to turn around in like 15 minutes so unfortunately my day 2 was completely washed out i just again walked around a little bit and we had a lot of entertainment inside the house so this is another thing right they are also um mechuka for me was also so much about living there with the people mm. luckily for me maybe i was housed up on day 2 so um gebu called so this is this is interesting they have a local celebrity who is a bruce lee look alike oh. okay. <laughs> okay a lot like bruce lee and he's this like he's really into martial arts and he's like part of entertainment in mechuka uh-huh. so gebu uh-huh. like you haven't heard of our bruce lee and i said no i haven't so he calls him home and uh, this guy comes to me and he's talking to me about martial arts and he does he shows off his talents which were incredible mm. so that was round one of entertainment where this guy comes down and he is pretty much putting up a show in the house for you and there were other guests who poured in as well because it was a really rainy days so no one could do anything so we had guests come over and it was like a party in the house uh-huh. where uh-huh. everyone's talking about their lives they're asking me about my life and what brought me there so it was a very um, indoorsy kind of day but i again met a lot more of the community okay that's great lovely so uh, tell us now that you have had this um, i don't know bitter sweet <laughs> experience uh, if i may <laughs> to say that how did your uh, day 3 pan out yeah so by by the end of day 2 it didn't look like i was going to get out on day 3 also <laughs> and that's what i was like oh my goodness that was like palpitating and and gebu very quietly just looked me in the eye and he says with great confidence it won't rain tomorrow okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know what are you even saying so because it it was it had it was relentless rain it hadn't stopped the entire day the skies were completely overcast and but you know i slept with the confidence of gebu's uh, prediction of the next day and i wake up to clear skies <laughs> it reminds, uh, reminds me of that scene from uh, swadesh i think right uh, where he looks at the sky and uh, forecasts the weather for oh, the next yeah. two or three days <laughs> <laughs> oh wow i forgot about that yes <laughs> very very similar to that yeah, so yeah. we wake up the next day bright and early and um, gebu takes out the car and so this was the day when um, i first went to the 400 year old monastery okay so it's called the samten yongcha monastery and it is about uh, 16 kilometers away from the town of mechuka mm-hmm. and uh, you then have to trek up the hill it's kind of like a hillock uh, small smallish mountain mm. and uh, it's about an hour upwards and an hour back down okay so you go up and it's this like gorgeous gorgeous monastery with a lot of like uh, tibetan buddhism influence so there's inside sure. there are a lot of these masks uh, of you know the dance the catch uh, the dances from that you see in visuals from bhutan so a lot of those kachak dancer masks and uh, a huge statue of the buddha then statues of their guru the rinpoche and all of that so you see the monastery you uh, see a couple of monks hanging around it's very very quiet it's up a mountain and and the thing is 
uh, it's such a small town that the the caretaker of the monastery has to be called in advance sometimes to keep the door open. Oh my god! <laughs> so they just they just I don't know they're sleeping inside or they're somewhere else and they just don't keep it open all day all the time because it's not like I said they don't get travelers so it's not in their a uh, system to you know want to keep it open for people okay. so gave you obviously had to call the caretaker in advance and tell him to keep it open because we were coming so um saw the monastery did that trek in the morning came back down and uh, now i must describe what you see in mechuka right there's uh, your <laughs> drive across these mountains uh, they have a large number of these bamboo suspension bridges over the river Mm. Okay. So uh, the main river in Mechuka is called the Yargyap Chu. It's kind of like the hero of Mechuka's landscape. It's my favorite uh memory of Mechuka is because they they kind of almost worship this river. It's loud. It's it's like it's unmissable. It it roars through even mm. if it's raining or not. It's this massive river which is basically the Brahmaputra River okay. which passes into uh, Arunachal is called the Siang River mm. and then upwards near along it's called the siom river mm. and finally yeah. upstream near mechuka it's called the yargyap chu because it's like the local name for the river that they've uh, they've given to it okay. so there is the river through all of this landscape so you have to there's there are so many times when you need to cross the river to go to another side so they have these uh, really age old bamboo hanging bridges which are really rickety and you think you're going to fall into the river it's like that old and that like scary to see <laughs> uh, it's again a big part of the landscape and could you describe the view around the monastery as well and the monastery so mechuka's landscape right there are uh-huh. layers okay first it, it's a flat table land at 6000 feet right so it's flat it's a valley it's uh, from when you look down the valley it's this flat table land that's where the most of the village the main mechuka village is uh-huh. then the next layers of course the the low uh, these are hills they're brown uh-huh. not much greenery on them so that's where like you said the brown comes in because it's this undulating brown hills all around and behind those hills are these gigantic mountains of the eastern himalayas mm-hmm. they're snow capped yeah. and uh, like i said the clouds there are really low hanging like that's it's interesting i the poet in me went all out with this and i was like it's almost like the clouds want to come down and kiss the oh. earth right <laughs> sometimes you don't even get to see the snow capped mountain so they they're always like it's a hide and seek so these are the layers and then of course there's the river flowing through all of it mm-hmm. and these mountains are full of pine trees so that's right. that's your landscape it's yeah. the closest hill that i can give you is is switzerland like you know you'd see these huge uh, stretches of flat land and then all of these layers behind it that's mm-hmm. kind of like the only visual i can Uh, relate to in popular culture i guess uh, yeah beautiful absolutely beautiful and if i'm not wrong i think the name mechuka also is uh, pretty much inspired by the river uh, it means uh, medicinal water or uh, so uh, yeah mechuka or uh, menchuka the locals call it menchuka actually uh-huh. so okay. mechuka means medicinal water of the snow oh wow okay, okay. right so yeah it's, it's so beautiful it's it's really uh, it's a nice mm, name yeah okay lovely yeah. Uh, So now that you've uh, spent some time here um, where do you head off to from from the monastery So yes ah uh, now the interesting and my favorite travel memory from Mechuka <laughs> okay. it, while I told you it's a fully buddhist uh, area with uh, that's the main faith uh-huh. what happened back in the 1980s is uh, there was this uh, Sikh regiment that was placed in uh, at the camp army camp in Mechuka okay right a bunch of Sikhs yeah. who built a gurudwara over the river interesting again this is about uh, another 10 kilometers from the monastery uh-huh. okay it's this beautiful beautiful gurudwara over the river so it's like either side of the gurudwara the river is like happily flowing through like loud and merry mm. and uh, every day they have a free they have a langar like a oh, meal oh yummy sure. okay <laughs> there are prayers at noon and you go there and I was like this one tiny little girl and there were all these army men like at least 50 to 70 of them in the main <laughs> hall of Gurudwara and we're all sitting down and the prayers are on and it was just like a very very surreal unexpected completely unexpected experience I know God, I'm quite... not religious, I'm not I'm not someone who uh, really actively knows about these things but just to sit there in the company of these people who come down from their army camp every day to eat this meal and to just you know pray and they believe basically that guru nanak stopped at this very spot and meditated on his way to tibet oh wow mm. okay that's yeah, interesting so that's, yeah they built 
Gurudwara there. So that's a very big part of the local culture as well. Mm. And at quite a oddity also, right? In some ways, because uh, uh, I don't think anybody would have expected uh, to see a Gurudwara, a, a bunch Not of monasteries, at- sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah, no, and it's so beautiful because it's out in the open so you finish your prayers and then they give you the prashad which is this uh, delicious halwa and then which I had three helpings of um, oh my god <laughs> yeah, a little bit. and then you step out and then it's the langar so you're sitting there and they're serving you the most amazing it's vegetarian food obviously but they serve you like fresh hot food from the kitchen and again you're sitting in this uh, it's out it's outdoors so you're sitting in these line in these rows with all these army men and then that's when I started talking to them about life in Mechuka and how you know it's 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 hard on them they're really yeah. far from homes there's no, no network and all because you know there, there are tensions around that area sure. uh, because China has kind of staked wanted claim to Arunachal and Mechuka so mm. um, it that again for me was a very very overwhelming experience just to be there in in, in the company of these people and you know it, it was such an oddity that it's an experience that really stays with me Absolutely. All the time. Absolutely. And I think uh, that's why we have to, and uh, no matter how grateful we are to uh, the army men, to our Air Force and uh, everybody, right, yes. in the military and everything, it, it's not enough because um, they give up so much, they sacrifice so much, uh, stay away from their family in such harsh conditions in some cases. You can only be grateful and um, <laughs> I think nothing more. Yeah, you can. One can go up to the base camp with prior permissions is what I learned later. I didn't have the permissions to go into the camp. Mm. But uh, we drove up to it because so that's another uh, spot to mention. Mm -hmm. The third uh, religion, so to speak, that I came across and did not expect to. So I've got Buddhism. I've got my taste of Buddhism. I've got my taste of like Sikhs, right, in their Uh Guruja. And then there is this, um, again, kind of like spooky, surreal sort of site. You drive up from the Gurudwara and on the face of this tall mountain opposite you is what they believe a naturally formed uh, face of Hanuman. Mm, okay. Interesting. Okay, and I when, when Gebu told me about this, he was like, do you want to go see it? It's very pretty. I, I'm i a non-believer in all of this. So I was very skeptical. I was like, what nonsense? It would, it would I don't think it's going to look like Hanuman and all of that. Mm. But I wish I could show you. I This is a podcast, but... <laughs> I was completely slapped in the face for my skepticism because we go there and we get off and there's this deep gorge and right opposite you is this flat surface of the mountain. and It's massive. It's, you don't even need a zoom lens so you don't need like, it is so big that you can see it with your eye and it's it's the face of Hanuman. It's I'm not even kidding. Like I don't know, sound like a lunatic right now, but it's there. Oh my God. And I don't know if someone's carved it out or if it's naturally there. But again, that's a very like spooky sort of. So there's a Hanuman Mandir on this side of the mountain where you stand to see the face. Mm, interesting. Yeah, all in all, I think the experience you've had this day, uh, kind of summarize or uh, sweetly put together uh, what India is also, right, uh, in a way, because... At the beginning of the day, you're at a monastery, you come down, you're at a Gurudwara and you end, uh, towards the end of the day, you're at a Hanuman Mandir. So uh, kind of sig- signifies how, how diverse India is also in that sense. Yes, absolutely. So, so diverse. And I did not expect this. So it was a very pleasantly surprising day. Very eventful. Mm. And uh, yeah, so that day then we got back. I learned to make some jewelry with Gebu's wife and kids. It was such a lovely, busy little day every day in that kitchen. You know, people would be coming and going and uh, grabbing a cup of butter tea or chang and, you know, talking. So there's a lot of rich conversation throughout my time at Mechuka with the locals. Mm, lovely. So, so we have one more day left, right, uh, yes. Sharanya? Yeah. Cool. So yeah. how is this? Uh, now you've come back to Gebu's house, settled down, uh, spent some time with uh, her, uh, his family, his wife and kids, uh, learning to make jewelry yeah. and all of that. Uh, relaxed day towards yeah. the end of it. Uh, so what were the plans for the next day? Uh, we first went to what is called another another village called the Dorjiling village. Hmm. Right. And okay. that was, again, a drive about half an hour drive to behind the, the hills that I could see from Mechuka town. Mm-hmm. And again, gorgeous drive across a bridge and you go, you pass these streams and you pass the river again. That river is everywhere. Like it follows you. And then uh, we got to Dodgy Ling where there is another uh, tiny little um, monastery inside which 
is this uh, gigantic statue of the Buddha. Mm. Okay, the end. We again uh, called the caretaker in advance. Went inside and saw this gigantic statue of the Buddha, mm-hmm. uh, fresh painted now again. So it looks really like new and colorful, and it's really it, that's it. It's like this small little wooden house co- sort of thing. It's a very tiny monastery, mm. and you enter. It's this huge Buddha staring down at you. So the, uh, that, and then we went to this place. It was kind of like a hike where. we had to uh, go to this area where uh, again they be- uh, there is a conflict here the mm. locals believe that this is where their guru the buddhist guru rinpoche meditated years ago okay. and his head impression is now a part of the uh, cave the rock okay. so as this like impression inside a rock and they believe that that's where he meditated for years so his uh, his head has left an impression mm. but the sikhs believe that's where guru nanak meditated and his turban has left the impression so it's like this little cave and then you go uh, you hike downwards from the cave behind it into this like really ever like enchanting forest sort of thing there's like a rock uh, stairs that they sort of cut out into the rock mm. and then you pass through this really really narrow crevice and again this is their belief that if you have if you have sinned you cannot pass through it turns out i haven't sinned i made it to the other side <laughs> all in one piece <laughs> hey, what about the uh, slightly healthier people what about them can they get through or uh... yeah it's not all that narrow you can get through but yeah it could be a bit of a struggle for but there's an alternate way to get down this okay. also like i said is just you know metuka is there's so many legends into their woven into their culture and tradition that you have to experience all of that like mm-hmm. it's a very uh, culture is a huge part of every experience that you'll have there so you pass this then you go down and uh, you're back to the other side of the river and it's 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 a really contained forest so there's a river running through mm-hmm. and there are trees all around you and there's this cave and you come down it and this is another interesting legend so there are two really tiny pools of water mm-hmm. deep pools of water by the river and they're full of three kinds of rocks or stones there are white stones there are black stones and there are these mixed like gray stones mm. so again legend has it that you have to put your hand in you get three tries mm. uh, if you pick out a white stone uh, you're going to have a great future and you know they truly believe that uh, it determines your destiny what you pick you pick a black stone you're going to f- go through some periods of struggle and if you pick a gray stone you have to go again if try again mm. so i managed to pick a white a gray stone in my first attempt and a white on my second so looks like i have a great bright future <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's something you do and then you go up to this waterfall which is um, there's a waterfall there as well again not really named mm. but uh, it's it's near this cave and uh, again there were a bunch of army people hanging out there and they were training so they were the way the waterfall is it's like uh, you have to sort of climb to get up there and you can also go behind the waterfall and come out mm-hmm. uh, so they were doing this whole like a uh, routine where they would time themselves on how fast they could complete the circuit around the waterfall so we hung out there for a while i tried doing it also needless to say my timing was atrocious really bad <laughs> <laughs> in comparison So yeah that that was another day and then day two was a lot of these tiny little hikes to just go and see random things that may or may not be there when you visit mm. but that's again the beauty of Mexico you just go to see things the locals tell you about and you know one day you're learning about a legend here the other day you're just chilling by the river side you're on a hanging bridge the other day so that day was a lot about getting to know the more you know uh, areas of Mexico these like little cordon of forests or you know rivers and river sides and all of that so that was like a very jungly kind of day like in the jungle uh-huh. and we rounded it up with a hike he was very impressed with my speed and so i was good that it enough to do these hikes because i really got to see more of the landscape and get deeper into mechuka's uh, natural beauty lovely it's been wonderful sitting and listening to all of your stories here and uh, i can only imagine how uh, how great the experience would have been uh, is is there more to machuka or was this uh, more towards the other day was this yeah this is more more or less it mm-hmm. uh, it like i said the the landscape i call it the dreamscape it it made me want to like write poems even though i'm not a poet but i did end up writing one which i should read out to you quickly if you have the time oh, yes please, please, please. yes <laughs> love to hear that yeah so it it goes um In a valley far, far away, there flows a river with a voice. Through lush forests and meadows and snowy mountains, it goes. Under rickety hanging bridges and over rocky beds, it roars. 
It talks and hums and merrily sings tales of lamas and tribes and other ancient things. Those were peaceful times before the world was hungry for power. It croons, no borders or walls or territorial violent loons. Om Mani Padme Hum. It chants as the valley echoes it back. The vibrant prayer flags flutter in the wind. Flap, flap, flap. No one honks here to chase a deadline or come first in a race. It says aloud. There's patience and goodness here. Look, there it is, floating with that misty cloud. You're blessed to be here, cut away from the trappings of time and a to-do list. Paradise has been found in hiding. It does exist. So yeah, that was my like wow. attempt. <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, we, yeah, we'd just like to stand up and give you a little round of applause. Yay! Yes. <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, I think it's uh, really beautifully written and um, kind of captures right. Everything, yeah. Um, yeah, the whole experience you've had and uh, uh, just the just the nature of the place as well. The way it is, uh, literally cut off from uh, the mainland yeah. in some ways. Then uh, the the presence of um, I think uh, you you also had that feeling of uh, st- staying. Uh, in a border border town or a border village, right? Uh, with the presence of the army, yeah. that also kind of added to it. And uh, of course, the landscape. So who can forget about the landscape? So it's a wonderful experience. And uh, we sincerely thank you for this, um, Sharanya. It's been lovely talking and sharing all of these. Uh, and uh, please tell us uh, and our listeners how people can follow your work. I know you're big on Instagram and uh, you, bl- you have a great blog as well. Please share all of these, uh, those details. We'll include links to all of them. But please do let us know how uh, one can follow your work sure thank you so it's it's truly nomadly on instagram twitter and uh facebook mm-hmm. and my blog is www.trulynomadly.com so that's those are the areas i'm most active on and that's where i write about my experiences i'm glad i'm glad we did this it's amazing to have this medium to talk about places you've been to i think i've always been a writer but i love also now having this medium to talk about my experiences so thank you guys this has been a great chat. Thank you so much, Sharanya. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, wish you all the best for your future travels. Thank you, Sharanya. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was yet another great episode of The Basafra Stories. If you guys like the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Audio Boom, Savan, Pocket Casts, Castbox, Stitcher, or any other podcasting app available on iOS or Android please do leave us a review on iTunes. It goes a long way in the show's discoverability. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. We go by the handle The Musafir Stories. Or, if it suits you, you could email us at themusafirstories at gmail.com or visit our website at www.themusafirstories.com for more information. All of these links will be made available in the show notes section of each episode. So here's to more traveling, sharing, and inspiring. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, happy travels and goodbye.